Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, people in YouTube land. Um, we're going to start off this morning, as the agenda says, with S101. Uh, this is a bill that we passed out of our committee. It got changed. Um, I'm not sure if it got changed at all in finance, uh, but it did get changed in appropriation. They took out uh, the money for the tax credits. Um, and then uh, it went over to the House and the House did major surgery on the bill. Uh, they took out some key parts, including the uh, wastewater and water duplication of permitting section, which was important to this committee. And uh, they added in a, and they took out the tax credits altogether, any wording around the tax credits. And then they also uh, added a mansion tax, which is known as the mansion tax, uh, an increased property transfer tax on, um, on homes that sold over a million dollars. And they uh, uh, added money to the mobile home replacement program. I don't have those words right, but uh, to help um, uh, to help replace, I think it was 35 new mobile homes was the projection. Uh, Ellen is here with us to give us some more detail on that history. And, uh, and she's was not uh, as intimately involved with the financial ends of stuff that I think took place in ways and means. In the house, the changes they made on the substance of the bill was in house natural resources, but in ways and means they did the tax credit issues. Um, so we may have somebody from joint fiscal or Abby Shepard come in uh, to talk more about this on the financial end later. So with that probably two wordy intro, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen. Ellen, welcome, good to see you. Thank you. Yes, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. You covered a lot of what I was going to cover briefly. So, um, yeah, just to remind you, S101 was introduced with four primary parts. It was the Bylaw Modernization Grant Program. Uh, then there was the expansion of the Downtown and Village Center Tax Credit Program to include neighborhood development areas and increase the cap on that amount that was available every year. There was also an appropriation for the going to the grant program, but then also for developers to go to the Department of Housing and Community Development to go to developers to assist in technical training on uh, infill housing. And then finally was the wastewater permit connection language, uh, removing the requirement that if a t uh, for an applicant to receive both a state and town wastewater permit. This bill then traveled to many committees. Um, it did go to Senate Natural Resources. It went to uh, Senate Appropriations. The money um, was removed in Senate Appropriations, the, the, the actual appropriations. However, those appropriations did end up in the budget and were passed last year. And so I think you will hear a little bit more about that, but the budget did contain the money for the technical assistance and for the, the bylaw modernization grants. Um, so then the bill went to the House. In the House, as Senator Sorakin stated, the first committee to work on it was House Natural Resources. In that committee, they made some minor changes to your bylaw, moderniza bylaw modernization program language and uh, we can look at that shortly. I have provided a side-by-side -side of the language. I think they largely kept your intent, but sort of just tweaked some of the language. But they did remove the wastewater permit connection language entirely. So then that bill went to House Ways and Means, where there they did remove the downtown and village center tax credit language and inserted the two sections that uh, Senator Sorakin mentioned the surcharge on properties over a million dollars, as well as the expansion of the tax credit for manufactured homes. So what has come back to you is a bill that has the 
bylaw modernization grant program language with some tweaks in it. And then the surcharge on million dollar properties and the increase of the tax credit for manufactured homes. So that's all that's in this bill right now. Okay. Um, so uh, just one comment on what Ellen said. I had forgotten that our bill went to Senate Natural Resources. And you remember one of the more contentious portions of this bill was the wastewater water duplication of permitting, which I think unanimously we all agreed uh, that was unnecessary to go to the state as well as a municipality that judged it by essentially the same standards. But there was a an uproar from some, uh, and certainly not all in the environmental community. So Chris Bray did a deeper dive on that section. And I think they also unanimously agreed with us that that um, should stay in the bill. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit, I don't have this on definitively, but that House Natural Resources that took that section out has come around a little bit. So they may be open to putting that back in. And that is one of the major portions of this bill. Um, I, the only other thing I would mention before we uh, turn it open to questions for Ellen is that, uh, and Senator Brock will remember this, the two provisions that are on this bill from Ways and Means, um, as they sent it back, you're dealing with the mansion tax and the manufactured home credit. Uh, we're also on, I think, Ellen, is it H-437? Yes, that bill did pass the House and is in Senate finance now. Right, and it came to, to us in finance, and we had a, a long debate on those two sections at the end of the session, and in finance, we decided not to go forward with those. Um, so you can see this is a fairly complicated uh, despite its shortness, is a fairly complicated bill um, and has had fallen into the jurisdiction of a lot of committees. Um, and uh, one last thing, I guess, is, and Chris will talk about this, is we had a, a bunch of somewhat oddball situations last year with the budget. So, uh, the, um, I think the way it happened is that uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee, as they want to do, is they put in a lot of money in the budget. And they took the money out of the bills, but held money sort of in reserve, anticipating bills would pass. And in the crossfire, some of the money passed, but some of the underlying legislation behind it didn't pass. And in some cases, it's questionable whether there was enough language in the budget bill to spend the money or what the outlines of it were. This is the bylaw modernization is perhaps one of those. There's no like, there's a bylaw modernization protocol or guidelines or statute in uh, our version of S101. And there's a similar one, though slightly different in the House version, but neither of those passed. And then in the budget, uh, there's $650,000 for modernization and technical assistance. And uh, the, um, the administration thought that was enough and uh, they designed a program and have awarded grants. Uh, I think we'll hear from Chris that it's pretty similar to what this bill has in front of it, but it's like the, what's the phrase, the cart leading the horse or something like that. The money's out there and then the program's gonna be defined in law after the fact. So um, that's where we are. Uh, I think that's a decent introduction. Is um, 
Do anybody have any questions at this point of Ellen or anyone else? Senator Clarkson has her hand up, Mr. Chair. Senator Clarkson, sorry. No, was, it's okay. I was reading I, the bill, sorry. You know, and that's far more important. I, 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 I guess I would say it's, there are two from our committee, we have two disturbing instances of this, both in S-79 and with S-101 of the money being in the budget, but the policy behind the money being separate uh, and not included and it's in, it's concerning because then it allows another body to make a decision about what that policy is that is the foundation behind the spending of the money. And I, I, I think this is a problem when we disconnect the money and the policy, which is what I know our appropriations committee has done quite a bit. But I, I think it's a big, bigger issue than... And I think it's an issue we need to address at some point with Jane, because it's um, it's now happened to us twice here. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, but in Jane's defense, she was trying to help us. Oh, uh, oh, she saved our tuckuses in large measure. I, I get that. Um, I mean, the we, three in, the three instances that I'm aware of is this, where it just says bylaw modernization. It may say a little bit more. But the, also on the VHIP program, the VHIP money, which never has been established in law, and the revolving loan program, right? Money went out on all three of these, and really, I, I think the I think you'll hear the administration tried to follow what the intent of at least our committee was on these programs, but that's uh, it, it, not quite kosher. I can't think of a better word than kosher in this context. I, I would agree. And it isn't necessarily always going to be that way. So I, I, anyway, I think it's a concerning trend that I think we should figure out how we better manage in the future. And I think too, Mr. Chair, if I could, um, I know that for the appropriations committee, it's always about making sure that we are moving forward on, you know, policies that matter a lot to our committees and it doesn't always, uh, move in tandem the way we'd like it to, but um, really look forward to us figuring out um, how to go revisit these and making sure that what is being carried out by the executive branch is in fact what the intention was of this committee. Okay, I, I think we all agree. Good, um, Ellen, thank you. We'll come back to you to walk us through the bill. Uh, Chris, how do you wanna do this with Jake? Um. <clears throat> Um, I just, um, I can kind of just walk you through a little bit. I was just, just going to do a little introduction reminder of kind of who we are and why we're here today. And then, um, update you on kind of what we've done over the summer. And, you know, I can tell you a little bit more about, you know, the politics and what we've, we've been doing this summer to kind of help set this up and then open this up for questions, if that makes sense. It does. Okay. Um, so good morning. My name is Chris Cochran. I'm the director of community planning and revitalization. It's great to see you guys. Um, um, I have one of the best jobs in state government and I'm supported by an incredibly talented and creative team or small team, but we definitely hit way above our weight. Um, we've had a very, very busy summer. Um, we allocated, you know, $3 million in downtown and village center tax credits. We had a nice event in St. Johnsbury to celebrate kind of how they've used that program to really revitalize their community. Senator Kitchell there was there and it was, you know, we were doing very few of these events, but the governor was there. So it was really nice to actually just get reconnected and to kind of the the work we do in these rooms and seeing the changes on the land. Um, We stood up as you noted, the bylaw modernization grant. we did, I would note just to add that we did have, you know, it's, it was a unique and kind of awkward situation for me. Um, so we did have conversations with both the chair of, Nat, of House Natural Resources and your chair, just to say, look, this is what we are intending to do. We did share the guidelines with both um, chairs just to make sure that we were on the right path. As you know, kind of the stuff we do in committee versus kind of when you have to actually figure it out into kind of the details, there were some slight differences but I can assure you that the spirit of kind of what you both passed, and if you do the side by side, it's largely aligned. That said, if, if the program does continue, and I believe there is support for the program, we'd like to see some small changes just so we can stand, continue to run the program as, as we've designed it. Um, but that's, that's for later. 
Um, we also stood up or working. It's been a bit of a challenge to create the um, Better Places Placemaking Grant Program, um, which is going to be a fabulous success. Um, we've gotten outside support. So the $1.5 million that you have allocated it already has additional funding and backing um, from um, the Department of Health, interestingly. Um, we worked hard at developing a curricula to train kind of Vermonters you know, how to, you know, Tinden County is going to do fine. <laughs> no offense, Senator Sorokin, but, you know, how do we, how do we get, um, how do we re-engage communities to take care of the places where they live, invest in, in their own backyard? In my village alone, there's two vacant abandoned buildings. You know, if I could just have the wherewithal and maybe the subsidy to take on one of these projects, I would do it. You know, this is where I live. And I would love to have a new family in my community and using those buildings. And it's just, you know, so we've been working on that. Um, that has not gone as fast as we, we have, but we have lined up a great potential trainer, but we have to go through the state procurement process and we do have a curriculum lined up. So that, that will be probably later in the year. Uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Senator Bounds. Oh, just uh, briefly, uh, Chris, you've, you've mm -hmm. piqued my curiosity when you said, interestingly enough, um, backed by the, Department of Health. I'm just curious if you could just, mm -hmm. just give us a quick um, take on that. It's very interesting and I just want to know just a little bit more. Yeah, they um, um, just high level. They, they have public health. I mean, the federal government has money for um, creating healthy communities. And a lot of the placemaking stuff in our downtowns involves, you know, promoting, you know, creating walking and biking, you know, and destinations, getting people out of their cars and getting people out on their feet and using their bodies again. So that's the nexus to kind of the, some of the placemaking stuff that we're doing. Um, but it's a great opportunity. And, you know, we're working closely with the Vermont Community Foundation to kind of be our fiscal sponsor to roll this up. It's, it's going to be an amazing program. Um, you know, the whole system, I guess, how we grant money is, is very risk averse and very slow. And to change the system to get to a quick yes is what we wanted. It's, it's been some work, um, but I think it'll be well received and by communities. And I, and I do expect a strong response. Um, uh, um, oh. I mean, uh, Chris, yeah. it, it, um, we put a one and a half million dollars for three consecutive years in the budget. Is that right? Um, it's, it's just 1.5 for, for now. And um, um, we were, you know, we anticipate that will probably last a year to two years. Okay. And you, when you were talking about your community, you had two units there that you would love to see developed. Um, I, I got lost as to what is the impediment now? What are you referring to that we haven't done? Um, so, you know, we have a great development community in Chittenden County, some areas outside of White River Junction, you know, in and around Hanover area, they, they, you know, there is a developer class who takes on projects and builds buildings. Um, in most of our communities, that's really not what's needed and that's not the right scale for them. In most of our communities, you know, the, the buildings are either run down or abandoned or vacant. So, you know, the VHIP program kind of helps a little bit with that. But what we need to be able to do is give people kind of the wraparound services, you know, give them the tools they need to, to, to take on a project where they live. Um, and there's been some amazing successes in other jurisdictions, you know, helping you know, giving people kind of the one-on-one nuts and bolts and the wraparound services to go through the permitting process, to figure out their financing, to make all these things happen. Is, um, it, is this the 150,000? Yes. Assistance? That's right. So, okay. so is this tied to the bylaws? No. So, so I'm, the, I'm a little lost where we are. Uh, my apologies. I've kind of lost you and giving my, well, we've been busy this summer doing a lot of different things. The, there's a $650,000 appropriation um, $500,000 of that goes to the bylaw modernization grants, 150, and this was what we discussed with, right. um, with um, the chairs, how to split those up. And the 150 will go to this training and wraparound services. Um, right. And I think this could, you know, this is important to you, Senator Sorokin, because I know you're very interested in, you know, how do we create more, you know, accessory dwelling units, you know, and I think this is, can be a, a, you know, a part of the strategy. You know, we need to get people excited convince people they can do that, provide them the services they need, but they also need an incentive. Um, and this kind of gets ahead of, you know, some of the stuff we're doing in 101 or was proposed in 101 could be a great development incentive to help these smaller scale and you know, get these smaller scale housing units back online or get them improved um, or break up some of these really large buildings that, 
you know, we're overhoused. We, our housing stock is not well matched for what our needs are. Um, so, but that's all that. And we could talk more about that later. So I'm sorry to jump us down a, a rabbit hole. Um, we've, we've also um, represented um, ACCD on the Vermont Climate Council. That was a fun ride. Woo! But um, the good thing is a lot of the ideas in S101 and things that we've been working on with this committee and others are you know, loaded up as recommendations in the Vermont Climate Action Plan. So that's great to see. Um, and finally, you know, it's, we're a pretty diverse shop. We've also supported the Everyone Eats program, which has been a huge success supporting our farmers and restaurants, um, keeping those people employed. They're approaching 2 million meals served and the New York Times is working on a piece to kind of showcase their incredible success in our communities, um, keeping people fed during this very difficult time. Um, Chris, may I just ask Mr. Chair? No. Yeah. Uh, it extended now through April, is that correct? It's That's correct. It's, it, so isn't, it is, you know, it's fully funded by FEMA um, and it is in budget adjustment. And the administration is fully supportive of it. So I don't anticipate any bumps. Um, we were also part of the stakeholder groups that worked with um, Representative Bongarts on his housing bill. Um, it has a number now, it's H511. And I'd be happy to tell you more about kind of what's in that when you're, when you're ready. Um, but bottom line, you know, <laughs> we're a small team. Um, the success that we've had is, is really, you know, contingent upon our partners and the people we work with. And this committee has been an incredibly important partner to us. And I just really want to sincerely thank you for your help and support. You know, stuff like zoning and bylaws is pretty wonky. And to have it kind of get such statewide prominence is incredible and um, due in large part to your support. So thank you. Chris and Ellen, uh, I think very quickly, um, I remember last year when we put 101 together, we sort of we're taking things from the ashes of 237. And some people didn't think we could do it, but we plowed ahead and did 101, which was some of the pieces. Ellen or Chris, do you remember the history very briefly of, and I don't need to go into the germaneness in Act 250, but what other substantive pieces were in 237 that got passed and which ones got into 101 and which ones are in the ether somewhere yeah and, um i might i'm gonna probably rely a little bit on jacob on the details because he just looked at the bill recently um um you know at the high level the pushback was you know it was kind of a municipal preemption you know we recognized that these areas had white water and wastewater capacity and that the zoning well intended was outdated and was holding up kind of the housing development and opportunities we'd like to see um, you know, it, it did pass the Senate unanimously, just moved incredibly quickly and then just hit the wall in the house. There was a lot of pushback from municipal planners, a lot of concerns about, you know, what comes next. Um, I will say that, you know, while a lot of the bill did not pass, um, it was incredibly important to kind of raise the issue about how zoning can, you know, complicate some of our goals of compact settlement of vital communities of housing development. So while we didn't hit the ball out of the park, it was a great conversation starter and you know, spawned the things like the bylaw modernization grants, which took a different approach. Rather than preempting you know, local zoning, it said, look, you know, who are the communities that are want to work on this and who want to see more housing options in their community? And let's figure out a way to support them through this process and give them the money and resources they need to modernize their bylaws. Um, the one that came out of the Senate was essentially sort of a carrot and a stick. We gave them like three years to do it, right. but then it would be imposed upon them if they didn't. Uh, right. Organization. Where did we wind up with um, two or four unit housing being treated similarly to uh, single family housing? Has that ever, uh, there was something in a bill last year not very strong, but. Yeah. Jacob, can you help me on that? You looked at the bill. Maybe, you... maybe Ellen can. Yeah. So that didn't pass. There was <clears throat> part of it that did pass was the um, prohibition on denying up to four units based on character of the area. And, right. Yeah. right. So that did pass, but the other provisions, um, so there, 
So just quickly, the, the parts that did pass, <clears throat> amending the definition of accessory dwelling unit to um, larger units um, fall under that now. Um, small lots, um, extend, extending the connection to allow small lot development, uh, yeah, denying character of the area for four unit dwellings, um, authorizing municipalities to adopt ordinances for short term on short term rentals. The uh, weird provision we had to deal with on invalidating deed restrictions, and then there was the language regarding um, the tri park facilities. Right. Um, so that I think is all that passed, and then there were quite a other few. So that bill originally started with David and Becky and I. So there were other provisions, including the wastewater connection provision. There were some Act 250 things. Um, I think Becky's TIF program may have been in there at some point. Um, and then also, yeah, the bylaw, um, requ the requirements for the density related provisions for bylaws, that did not make it. Ellen, would, would you, uh, I don't know if, it, I think it would be helpful to me um, if you could just make a bullet list of ideas that passed out of this committee that are still out there that we haven't uh, acted on yet, if that's possible, just a one, a short one page or just like, like the uh, two units treated, duplexes treated like, you know, like that kind of stuff. I don't sure. know if a lot of it, but sounds but, like there are a few. So, uh, Miss, Mr. Chair, may I ask for a slight yes, expansion of that? Because it would be great to know the pieces that did pass because they passed in different places. And so, it, in some, sometimes it was hard to keep track of what passed and what didn't pass. So, it would be great, Ellen, if we could just do bullets of each what passed, what didn't pass, so that we need to. Okay. Just yeah, like back, I think the Better Places program was in 237 to start also at some point, and then it kind of moved to. So there were a lot of things. 237 was huge when it was first introduced. Exactly. Kind of, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm like a bad penny. You know, when I pass something out of this committee, I want to keep <laughs> working on it to make sure it finally gets to the governor. <laughs> Though that hasn't worked out real well either. So anyhow, um, Thank you, uh, Senator Brock. Just, just an observation. Uh, this, this entire subject can get incredibly complex because each element uh, depends to one extent on the other. It would be great if we could take a look at all these various elements in some type of a graphic form uh, so that we can see how they relate to each other. Uh, I know ACCD, uh, I'll tell you who it was, was uh, the uh, business, oh, the, the organization that does business uh, uh, grants and so on uh, under ACCD, separate organization. I'm, I'm escaping the name right now, uh, but they had a very, very excellent graphics capability that could take something like this that we, we, we lose information when we look at just a bunch of bullets and show how they relate to one another graphically, almost on a single page. That would be a very, very helpful tool, I think for us and also for the public trying to understand what it is and how all these things fit together. Yeah, I, 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 I think that would be helpful. I mean, I can see like one, like it divided up in thirds or something. One is like, money programs, other are policy laws, and then maybe a third being, I don't know exactly what, but a miscellaneous thing. But it all, I mean, if you look at the title, I love the title of one, the purpose, and Ellen probably wrote it, the purpose of S101. It's something to do to promote housing through smart, in, in smart growth areas or something like that. And that's, what we're trying to do. And I think we get, sometimes we get stuck because it tends us, you know, a, a poster child, positive or negative is Act 250. And that's very controversial and it could slow down other good efforts when you get into that discussion. So um, 
But, but this the is program important. that I was picking up, by the way, was the veggie program that does a very excellent job of taking information about a program and designing it graphically. They have the tools and perhaps uh, Chris might consult with that group to see if there is a, uh, there's someone there that could help do that for us. Right. I appreciate that. Okay. You're on mute, Chris. I'd be happy to do that. And, and I think it may be beneficial too, since you're, you haven't really started talking about it, but looking at um, um, Representative Bongartz's bill and how that probably overlays graphically, because you've got some policy and some funding pieces and some Act 250 pieces that all kind of come together in centers. And I don't, I don't quite have a vision for how I'm going to do that graphically, but I, I like the challenge and I think it would be instructive. So we'll take yeah. that. Thank you. Senator Rob. Thanks. Um, Chris, I might send over a bill that I've been working on as well. Um, while we have Ellen here, um, we thought a summary would be helpful. I haven't had time to do it. And I think um, I haven't heard from, from David Hall about that. Ellen, I don't know if you could help with that. Um, but it has a lot of pieces that may be in Representative Bongartz's bill as well. Um, things like a fund to help commercial properties transition to uh, the residential amenities they would need to come online, a three-year TIF extension. I'm not sure if you've heard from communities about their falling behind because of the pandemic and needing that. Um, a reduction in the need to, like a basically one-to-one -one, um, need to, to remediate agricultural soils outside of a neighborhood development center mm -hmm. if you're developing within um, a neighborhood center. Mm -hmm. Etc. Um, I just wonder, I just think this is really the time to, like you're saying, take good bills from the House, the Senate, wherever they come, um, and uh, get more housing online and get the opinion of the, of the administration on, you know, which of these things is, it can be implemented most quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's a good point for me to share my thinking of this morning. Uh, and it's preliminary, but I would want to talk as a committee about this. But just like everybody's expressing, uh, housing is at the top of everybody's list. And there's so many ideas there that I'm more and more interested in putting together a committee bill that starts out like Kevin Mullen used to do with all these ideas in various sections. And like with the House sent us last year on economic development. They sent us one bill and it was their economic development bill and it had 15 different sections, which we went along with most of them. But so I'm thinking that um, we, we would have a deadline on a committee bill, but deadlines can find their ways to get extended, but of, of the 31st of January. So we could ask Ellen and David Hall and Erin to, to, to take all these ideas put a 50 page bill together and go section by section. And that I think accomplishes some of what you're all saying. Senator Brock said, you know, there's so many moving parts and they affect each other and we would have them in one place. And if we start working on one section and they said, well, what about the section we just dealt with? It works against that. We would have it in one place as, a, as opposed to passing out five or six different bills. And we could, incorporate house bills, we could incorporate, I know several of you are working on housing bills that we may see in the next couple of days. So we can put them all in one place. And, um, and you know, I, I think it's more likely to reflect our values and get signed into law if they're all in one place, as opposed to uh, people having PowerPoints in this process to kill an individual idea. So um, anyhow, we'll talk more about that as an approach, but that's how I was feeling this morning. Um, okay, Chris, let's go back to you, unless there are other questions. Um, uh, can we start with bylaw modernization and tell us like the three versions, our version, the House's version and what you've implemented at this point? Um, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna give you the quick summary of kind of what, what happened. You know, We got a strong response. We work closely with the regional planning commissions to um, get their input on their program. They obviously provide a lot of the services to help the communities. And so we wanted them fully engaged. 
Um, with with their input, we did make a, a few changes. I'm going to ask Jacob. Jacob stood the program up, so I'm going to ask him to speak about the details. But we got an incredibly strong response. Um, you know, oversubscribed, I, by, I believe, by 150,000. Um, but I think we're going to announce this Monday or Tuesday next week. Um, you know, 41 communities we were able to support biomodernization in those in, in, in 41 communities, which is incredible. Um, 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 and they're going to get to work. And you know, this is going to make neighborhood development area designation easier for many of these communities. So some this kind of feeds into um, the tax credits and Senator Bongarts or not Senator Representative Bongarts's bill. So um, um, it, I think yeah, to your Senator Brock, to your point, I think a graphic pulling all these pieces together would be really, really helpful, <laughs> even to me. Um, Jacob, I'm going to pass the mic to you. If you could just say a little bit about, you know, we, we largely follow the intent, you know, the House didn't make a bunch of changes and, you know, um, but if you could speak to a little bit where the changes were, we did offer language, I think, um, to just ensure that the program we stood up was consistent with, you know, if you do move forward on this, so it's consistent with what what we created. Good morning, Jake. Good morning, Good morning, senators, and thanks for your time. So, on when we were putting together the bylaw modernization grant program, we uh, we referred very closely to both the House and Senate version and uh, created guidelines that aimed to be very very consistent. We also collaborated with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Regional Planning Commissions, who were, who were tremendously instrumental and making sure that we got the interest in this program that we did. Um, we had, we have three uh, multi-town applications serving 18 municipalities uh, led by regional planning commissions. And then like Chris said, 41 municipalities overall. Um, the, the only significant difference between uh, the program guidelines and in my view, uh, and the house version was that the department rolled out a program that favored avoidance and minimization instead of a hard exclusion for natural resources areas, including uh, flood hazard and river corridors. And that's because the bylaws cover the whole municipality. They often overlay natural resources. They can be regulated locally and they're frequently subject to a state permit. Um, and so uh, to, to go with that language, we thought would be lead to very complicated administrative reviews at closeout and put the municipalities in a really tough place in, in, in considering how they might want to avoid and minimize um, natural resources areas, but still develop in accordance with the Agency of Natural Resources uh, model river corridor and flood hazard bylaws and, and, and wetland permitting standards. So, Is that a, uh, so the House and the Senate both had a prohibition and I, I think we were following your department's lead pretty much when we passed that. Uh, I don't remember hearing that concern back then, uh, or maybe I'm not understanding it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, on offhand, I don't know if both the House version and the Senate version had both the exclusion. I thought there was a, I'm recalling that there was a distinction there, but I'd have to, I'd have to look into that. Um, even so, we feel that that was, um, uh, a minor modification still consistent with the intent that uh, that we wouldn't be promoting housing in uh, in important natural resources. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I'm just saying, I mean, we may fully agree with that, but it does raise a flag that if we passed it out in one way, and uh, I get a little concerned that some of the players out there may have had undue influence on what you ultimately came up with and uh, changed what we had suggested. So um, we can talk more about that, but it sounds like it's, it's still getting at the same purpose. So, um, so I, I saw the grant list and it looks like the average grant is in the 20 or low twenties or something like that. How much can that really buy? I mean, I've been on planning commissions and DRBs and I've seen rewrites of bylaws that had to cost a lot more than that. Uh, Mike Mungin comes to mind as the guru of all planning uh, bylaw rewrites. Uh, and he was working with the Essex planning 
commission for years to rewrite their bylaws. Yeah, well, $20,000 can go uh, quite a ways uh, depending upon the scope of the project. If you're doing a bylaw overhaul, that's, uh, that would be a lean budget. Um, but, uh, but I think this program is really looking at those smart growth areas, particularly the zoning districts um, in and around uh, village centers and designated downtowns. Uh, so it wasn't a time, it wasn't targeted at townwide uh, zoning, but enabling and opening up more housing opportunities in those smart growth locations and, uh, and taking incremental steps uh, that could have a big difference. Uh, and again, this was uh, linked back to the department's uh, zoning um, for great neighborhoods initiative that produced the enabling better places guide, all designed to make it easier to uh, welcome housing in and around centers. Uh, and take incremental measures that can have a big difference in, in housing. So um, when you're looking at just a few districts, I, I, we feel that the scopes were very much in line um, with the with the allocations uh, because they were targeted. And many of them had uh, quotes to back them up. Those and, budgets up. And having the regional planning commissions engaged, you know, there's an economy of scale, you know, for instance, um, um, Represent our Senator Clarkson, you know, in your district, Two Rivers, um, I think they aggregated six applications um, uh, yeah. you know, for $60,000. That was a great value. But, the, you know, for the smaller communities, there's going to be largely the same language. So I think you're getting, you know, a huge value. It'll be customized based on the community, but um, engaging them in that process really, you know, made the whole exercise a lot more affordable. Chris and Jake, how are you going to? Uh, monitor the deliverables on this uh, in terms of yeah. what what do they have to produce for the $20,000 or how would that work? We would be looking at their um, at the bylaws prepared at the end of the process and uh, and there would be a narrative based uh, closeout report where we would ask that the municipalities to explain how they've met the program requirements. Is this the program that we were sort of trickling out money where at the last payment might come upon the deliverable or something? Yes. It is, yeah. there's an incentive uh, to, um, if, if the bylaws are adopted um, before the closeout period and there's a 24 month timeline to do that, right. then but the program, yeah, we'll forgive the 10% match. Got it, I remember that. Right, so it's a two year okay. process. Right. Okay. All right, so anybody have any more questions on the bylaw section? Um, so moving on to the wastewater section, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this. Tom Weiss, who is a, a consumer constituent uh, who was against the elimination of the state permitting has sent uh, a renewed or new letter that's posted online. I think he may have mailed it to everybody. Um, uh, I, don't know whether, I don't know whether it's anything new from, I know he was active in both our committee and in natural resources last year. And essentially um, uh, we decided to go forward with the elimination of duplication. Uh, so you can read that letter and we can, uh, make a decision, but just keep in mind, I, I, I need to go back to the framework we're under here. The, this is a bill that passed the Senate and passed the House. We are in a position now where any day, any one of us could stand up theoretically and on the floor of the Senate right now and say, I move that we concur. I move that we um, concur with further amendment uh, one other option is to move the bill back into committee. Uh, but, you know, at the very least, I think we're charged with trying to preserve the Senate position. Um, so we've made a decision on this. The House didn't agree with it, but my understanding is that they're more, they're warming up to our position on this. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Chris, you have any more information or feel comfortable expressing anything about that? Yeah, um, I don't want to speak for Representative Bongards, but he, I mean, he did express second thoughts. Um, 
about passing, uh, about removing these provisions. And he was open to reconsider reconsideration. I don't know um, if he's talked or to the extent of conversations that he's had with his chair and his fellow uh, committee members on this, um, but he did express to me just kind of a, a regret. Um, um, so there, the remaining issue, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is really the downtown tax credits, which I talked about earlier. There's differences, obviously, between our committee appropriations and the House. Um, I guess I would ask you, Chris, to describe your position or the administration's position mm -hmm. on the two versions of the bill, the Senate version versus the House version of the mm -hmm. bill. Uh, um, the, the, the Senate version of the bill um, basically made a permanent change to the downtown and village center tax credit program to extend the benefit to the neighborhood areas. Um, we, House Commerce also supported that change, um, but members and ways and means, means the chair, uh, I think the vice chair had some concerns about making a permanent change. They said, you know, this is a really good program. It works. I, you know, they wanted to essentially just partition it off um, and give and and test the expansion for a, a five year period to see if we could prove the outcomes that we we believed that we would have improving the quality of the neighborhoods in and around our downtowns. Um, Ellen drafted some language that basically you know, mirrors the existing program, but creates you know a standalone tax credit for the neighborhood development areas. Um, early indications with ways and means are that it's supportive of this. Um, and if you, you know, want to take another look at your bill, I do believe incorporating the language that ways and means is supportive of, um, will get a good reception there. Um, thank you for that. The, <laughs> the question more directly <laughs> was, what is the administration's position oh. on the Senate passed bill versus the house passed bill? Um, um, the Senate pass, I'm sorry, the Senate pass bill is a better bill and we would rather see that bill than the house pass version. If the Senate bill as is went to the governor, would he sign it? I can't speak for the governor, but, um, I know he's a, you know, obviously housing is, is a, a big concern of his, um, and he's been a big supporter of the downtown and village center tax credits. Um, I think we're going to hear more about this and hopefully the state of the state and the budget address. And um, I think that's where you're going to get a good indication of how strong his support is. is, what is the, does he have support for the, any kind of continuation of the bylaw modernization program? Um, it was internally was, um, I, I, people understand um, that the permitting framework that we have in Vermont is complicated and is, in, and is hindering the opportunities that we want. So I do believe um, there is strong support for the bylaw modernization grants. The amounts and to the extent, again, I'm not privy to that. Is there anything in the Budget Adjustment Act, I think is public, mm -hmm. the governor's proposal at this point. Is there anything in there that affects any of these programs that you're aware of? Budget not to my knowledge. Um, there's several, um, funding adjustments for housing related programs. And I believe um, Deputy Secretary um, Brooks um, should be able to comment on them. Okay. Senator Clarkson, do you have a question? No, I was going right to where uh, Chris went, which is I believe that we'll see healthy and robust support for expansion of the downtown tax credits in the budget address. It's what my, my hope is, because they've certainly been, the administration's been very supportive of the Senate's position on this. Okay. Um, let's see, does anybody else have questions or uh, any further comment comments you'd like to make before I go back to Ellen? All good. Exciting about better places. I mean, I think it's all it, good. 41 communities doing bylaw modernization. That's great. Yeah, no, and we love to do more. So I hope we can get support to continue this. It, okay. Well, we'll chat about So, Ellen, we're going to break in about six minutes in case the committee 
is unaware of. We have goals of two 10, 10 minute breaks each morning. Uh, we start at nine, there'll be a 10 and an 11. Uh, and then it varies a little bit depending upon our scheduling. But I'd like to try as best possible to keep to those. So we have about five minutes to get started. We may finish. Um, could you just walk through the language and the changes that the house is suggesting on the bylaw modernization sections? Sure. So I did um, ha send a document to Scott this morning as a side-by-side. -side. Um, mm -hmm. That is a side-by-side. -side. And so I will put it up on the screen, but it is posted on your website. Great. And so the bill as it came back from the house does look a little bit strange because so many amendments are in there, but Basically what happened is the very first section of the bill has never changed. It's a very short piece of language that just cross references this new program with the municipal and regional planning fund um, because this program is going to be able to draw funds from that existing fund that is funded by the property transfer tax. So that's section one, it has not changed. But section two, the house did make some small tweaks too. So I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see the side-by-side -side document? Yes. Yeah, it, it's easier in some ways. It's bigger on our own uh, second, uh, if we have our iPads or something to look at it, it's slightly bigger. <laughs> okay, so I can stop sharing if that's what you would prefer. Um, I, if you, I, I would like to keep it on. So, okay. Great. Oh, that's better. Okay. So, um, so section two, so section two, as you will remember of this bill, it adds a new section to title 24, establishing the language on this bylaw modernization grant program. So the language that this committee passed and that the Senate passed is on the left side of the document. The language that the House passed is on the right and the changes um, are in yellow. And I don't think there are too many, um, but I will read you the House version that has come over from the House. So there are created municipal bylaw modernization grants to assist municipalities in updating their land use and development bylaws to support a development pattern that is pedestrian oriented and consistent with the smart growth principles established in 2791 of this title. So this is going to be sort of a theme throughout this amendment. The House really did want to focus on smart growth areas and smart growth principles, and that was in your bill, um, but I do think they added a little more detail about what that meant. So the grants shall be funded by monies allocated from the municipality allocation of the municipal and regional planning funds established in 23 uh, in 4306A3C of this title and any other monies appropriated for this purpose. So moving down to section B. Is there really much different? What do you how would you in lay terms in that first thing section? say the difference between House and Senate? Uh, it's, I think it's just a small change. They are a committee that's focused on the natural resources and the environment. And so they did, um, they are very concerned about pedestrian travel and making sure that there are smart growth. So while yours has a reference specifically to housing, which makes sense, this is a committee that usually focuses on housing. So. Um, I don't think it's much different. Um, it just adds a specific reference also to the smart growth principles in 2791. Uh, Chris, does that, in your mind, is the first thing restrictive in any way? I mean, uh, it says the development pattern that is pedestrian oriented. I mean, does that allow for um, bylaw changes that don't promote housing, but promote uh, sidewalks or commercial development downtown or? 
I think it's consistent with the goals to create housing opportunities because you want to, you know, dense housing needs to be connected. Um, and once it's connected, um, then you have opportunities to reduce vehicle uses, uses. So I think they're all supportive. Okay. Let's just deal with this next section and then we'll take a 10 minute break. Okay. So, um, what is now section B was previously your section E. So they just um, moved this section up higher into the into the section, um, and it's still largely the same. So I'm on the right side of the page B. A municipality that receives a grant shall use the funds for the adoption of bylaws that increase housing choice, affordability, and opportunity in smart growth areas. These smart growth areas shall be areas that reflect the smart growth principles in 2791 that are located outside important natural resources area, natural resource areas and are located outside identified flood hazard areas and river corridors or are acceptable for infill development as defined in the Vermont flood hazard area and river corridor rule. So again, most of this language was already in your bill, but there was some clarifying language at the beginning to sort of, well, what does eligible mean? But this is about receiving the grants. They added affordability. Uh, they took out the, uncon I don't specifically remember the conversation about the unconstrained water and sewers area, um, but uh, and then they changed suitable to acceptable. Um, I don't, I don't know how much of a, how strong of a difference that is, okay. but. Um, the same question for you, Chris, this either one works for you pretty much. Yes. Yep. So, um, let's take a break before we do, Chris, could you, on your to-do list, could you just get us a short memo that in your ideal world, on, I guess, this section and all sections of the bill, uh, what you would like to see the language yeah. read, you know, I assume you're gonna try and make the language more reflective of the program that you've already put in place. But if you can get us that language for those changes, that would be great. Yep, absolutely. We can get you that today. Thank um, you. And then yeah. um, I'll work, it, it'll take us a little bit of time to think about kind of a, a graphic that puts together all these pieces, um, but we'll work on that too. Okay. So thank you, everybody. We'll take a 10 minute break, come back at 10, 10, and we have about 20 more minutes on this, and then we'll move to S79. Thank you. That was very helpful. Bye bye. Yeah. You're side by side, and hopefully, we can finish this up in the next 20 minutes and move on to the next bill. Yeah, there aren't too many more changes. So um, on page two of my side by side, we're in subsection C on the right side, <clears throat> um, small change here. Disbursement to municipalities shall be administered by the Department of Housing and Community Development through a competitive process, providing the opportunity for all regions and any municipality to compete regardless of size. The house added, um, the department shall to the extent reasonably possible ensure that grants are awarded with the intent, intent of achieving geographic distribution across the state. So the house was very interested in making sure that all the grants didn't go to Chinton County. <laughs> um, or Franklin. Um, so or then Franklin. moving on, hey. the, the next two sections don't have any changes, but just to remind you, funds may be dispersed by the department in installments to ensure the municipal bylaw updates meet the goals of the section. Funding may be used for mapping, the cost of Regional Planning Commission staff or consultant time, carrying out the provisions of subchapter five through 10 of this chapter and any other purpose approved by the department. On to page three, to receive a grant, the municipality shall identify any municipal water supply and wastewater disposal activity uh, capacity opportunities and constraints within mapped service areas in both traditional water and wastewater systems and smaller scale municipal systems. 
including soil-based wastewater treatment and decentralized water and wastewater systems. So uh, wastewater systems have been a, a pretty big topic in connection with this bill. The House did spend time on this. Um, so they added more language here to, I, I think, address some of the, the smaller um, alternative water system, wastewater systems that are in some of the towns. Next, um, the, the municipality shall allow at a minimum duplexes within smart growth areas to the same extent that single family dwellings are allowed. Require parking waivers in appropriate smart growth areas and situations. Ellen, can I, can I stop you on yep. duplexes? So this goes in both versions, it goes a little further than um, what we did in terms of uh, consistent with the character of the area, but this is just for the communities that want grants under the bylaw modernization, right? Correct. Um, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, we addressed we addressed this aspects of this issue in two different places, one in the bylaws and one in the housing. I can't remember which 237, whatever, you know, where we talked about this. Yeah, but yeah, this is going to be required of the 41 towns that asked for financial help. The right. other one is for the whole state. But right. it's, not, it's not a uh, a total mandate. It's a um, it's a semi. It's not as strong as this. It, it's, it's an encouragement. Right. 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 And this is um, restricted to smart growth areas. So it's it's allowed duplexes within smart growth areas. So it's in a full um, mandate that duplexes are allowed. Right. Did we, that's a good point, that when we were struggling with the duplex issue and we came up with the middle ground of consistent with the character of the area, did that also apply to just downtowns or smart growth areas or was it statewide? Um, I believe it is statewide um, because it's in the, the section of law related to conditional use review. Um, so uh, it is four areas, but it's 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 fair it's a little bit specific. So it's four areas that allow multi-unit dwellings and require conditional use review. Those multi-unit dwellings cannot be denied for character of the area. Okay. So they could be de denied for um, other reasons like water constraints or um, you know building concerns, but character of the area, you can't say that a, a multi-unit dwelling doesn't fit the character of the area. I, when you do your bullet things of things that this committee has passed, uh, I'd be very curious as to whether we ever passed anything on duplexes per se, other than this, other than the one you're talking about. I don't, in other words, I don't know whether that was a compromise as it went through the whole thing and we started off stronger, but if you can refresh our memory on that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think the duplex language came out of uh, 237, but I, I will check. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, number three, the municipality shall require parking waiver provisions in appropriate smart growth areas and situations. Uh, it shall review and modify street standards that implement the complete street principles and that are oriented to pedestrians. And then this is where there's another change a little bit. So the municipality shall adopt dimensional use, parking, or other standards that allow compact neighborhood form and support walkable lot and unit density, which may be achieved with a standard allowing at least four units per acre with site and building design 
standards or by other means established by the department. So the House slightly modified your language. Um, they spent a lot of time talking about acreage size. <clears throat> and overall, I think both you, the Senate and the House have a goal of this section being flexible. And so <clears throat> they are, you know, the, the department is allowed to set standards here on how to achieve um, unit density. So um, allowing four units per acre or by other means established in the guidelines. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one quarter acre lots couldn't be used. Um, I just, uh, I, I think I re recall that there was a little, they had a hard time deciding on a, an acre size. So they just um, removed it. Um, and then finally, the last change, they added another bullet point. So the, the municipality shall demonstrate how the, the bylaws support implementation of the housing element of its municipal plan as provided for in 4382, related to addressing lower and moderate income housing needs. Uh, so they added that. And then finally, just so you know, the date here is um, September by September 1, 2021, the department shall adopt the guidelines to assist in um, applying for grants under this section. So it, that may need to change potentially if you're good, if you want to move forward with this language, but so. So I, is Chris still with us? I don't think so. Is Jake? No. no. They have departed. Okay, well, I, I, I think it's, this question is better asked of them, but I'll try it with you, Ellen. Um, this stuff, you know, I'm proud of this work we did here. This is really good. I'm just wondering whether uh, most of these people who are applying for money are only ones that have already pretty much gotten there already. Because um, this, is, this is pretty uh, good planning language, good smart growth language, and uh, on the other hand, you know, I can see towns being scared of committing to doing this, taking the money and having to do all these things. So uh, you probably don't know the answer to that, but in seeing the applications and knowing the towns that have applied, we'll ask Chris whether, um, you know, this is achieving its purpose of making changes in those bylaws or those things already exist and they're taking the money and going to do it use other change do other changes to modernize their bylaws anyhow uh is that true that you wouldn't know the answer to that um i don't know the answer but my uh my only thought is in re in looking back at this language um here at the top of page three um f so the intro language here i do think is a little bit unclear, could be clarified slightly. So it says to receive a grant, the municipality shall do the following things. And so it may make sense to um, invert that slightly and say, um, after re re upon receiving a grant, the municipality shall do the following things. Right, right. Um, because it, it almost reads as though they have to do all these things before they get the money. Right. And right. so that I think leads to your concern about have towns that have already done a lot of work as opposed to helping towns that haven't done as much work. Right. So Mr. Keep, Chair. I, I, I hope Ellen, you'll keep reminding us of that. <laughs> we don't let that go. Cause I think that's pretty critical. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, may I just ask a question? Yes. So, I mean, this is our legislative language, but they, of course, have now stood up this program and have their own language. Um, does it, so it would be interesting to see in this particular area how they, what, it would be great to have a third side by side, sort of the language, the operational language, which is what they're using. 
uh, because clearly the language wasn't too big of an impediment if 41 towns have, uh, if 50 towns applied and 41 got grants. So uh, I'd just be curious to see if the language here seemed to be less of a hurdle in the operational program, which got set up. And I think as we look at actually finally passing this, we should see what they actually did. Can you, can you work with Chris to put a third element in there, Ellen? I, I think sure. we asked Chris already to come up with language changes he would wanna see that this does not reflect. I, I think I've always heard Senator Clarkson that these, these uh, six things are aspirational uh, and not required up front. Right. Luke Ellen's correct. That's the way it could technically read, but I, I'm even worried, even if it's aspirational, are people applying when they know they can, they have already met it or easily can meet it and it may not be going to the, the best places that need the changes. So um, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, all right, so the other thing I guess we can move to is uh, the section on downtown tax credits. So do you have something on that as well, Ellen? Um, I don't have anything prepared because the house just removed everything that you did. And so I can put that language up, but it's actually very simple. It just adds downtown <clears throat> neighborhood development areas to the uh, downtown and village tax center credit program. So it just adds that that is an area where buildings are eligible to receive those tax credits. Okay, could you just, before we end, we have like four minutes, can you give us a quick overview of what the downtown tax credits can be used for and, you know, maybe the highlights of what the expansion we had we had wished for would do for those neighborhood development areas and what a neighborhood development area is. Sure, so um, the, the state designation program has five different designations in it. There are these sort of three core programs and then add-on designations. So the three core designations are downtowns, village centers, and new town centers. Um, so that currently tax credits are available in designated downtowns and designated village centers. There are three types of town uh, tax credits under this program. They are for um, facade improvements to the, to the outside of the building, code improvements, um, such as like an el elevators is one of the big examples. And then there's also a historic rehabilitation tax credit so that uh, for historic buildings. So buildings in existing downtowns and village centers are eligible to apply for these tax credits. Um, and so your bill was going to extend that to also include neighborhood development areas. So neighborhood development areas are added on top of either a downtown uh, village center or new town center. And so it is, um, it covers that, that designation and then also extends further into um, these, the residential areas around the, the compact centers. So uh, they're largely neighborhoods where people live. Is that, desi is that designated specifically? I mean, when they, the, they get a map and say, this is it and we want approval for that. Okay. Yes. And is yeah. there, are there guidelines like how far out from the town center they could go or? Yes, yes. It's either one quarter mile or right. one half mile from the, the center of the downtown. So they're, they're larger than the, the centers, but not by much. They're not supposed to be huge areas because it's just supposed to be the, the around the, the commercial core. Mm -hmm. And if I may, Mr. Chair, one of the reasons I think this is so attractive is our actually our, our, our village cores and downtown cores are actually smaller than we think. We think, oh, the whole downtown, but actually the designated parts for these village centers and downtowns are actually 
smaller than you think. So um, that's particularly for me why the neighborhood development areas are mm, attractive for us to expand into because, you know, in our town, it would be, it would basically just include the rest of what we all consider downtown. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Anything anybody wants to add or um, we'll obviously be revisiting this, but this was a great session. Thank you, Ellen, very much. Do you have anything you want to say in closing at all? No, I just would add that I think the, the part that the house struggled with is that there are 23 downtowns, there are 200 village centers, but there are only seven or possibly eight neighborhood development areas. So right. there are only a few and they're only located in certain areas. So um, there are more towns applying all the time, but that program is not as old as or as large as the other programs. But this would make it more attractive to apply for them. Potentially. So. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was a piece of, of what is going on. Great. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, we will now move on to uh, S79. And we have with us uh, Tate Brooks, and um, I don't know if anybody else. David Hall is with us. David Hall. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief overview for the committee of where we're at. And thank you, Tate and David, for being here. Um, this bill uh, is our rental housing health code bill. It also had VHIP, and I always forget the nomenclature for the revolving loan fund. Uh, I think we appropriated, we wanted $5 million for VHIP and $1 million for the revolving loan fund. Uh, that got into the budget, uh, but the bill did not pass. So we have another of these situations where we appropriated money with like a sentence and we didn't fully by law define the program. So um, this is the, we've been working on this, this committee has been working on this bill for I think three years. Um, I think other people have been working on it for a lot longer. Uh, it has primarily to do with uh, enforcement of the uh, housing, rental housing health code and the shortcomings of doing it through a volunteer program uh, at the local level. Um, uh, we passed it, the house uh, made a few changes and we concurred and sent it to the governor. Uh, we were taken a little bit by surprise on the veto because, and we tried to stop that from happening as best we could uh, because many of the concerns were not, um, let's put it this way, loudly articulated. Um, but that's the prerogative of the governor's office. And uh, I know for one, Senator Clarkson and I have been working very hard to get to yes on this. Uh, uh, Senator Brock will warn us that he told us so. Uh, <laughs> but um, still trying to get to yes. And that's why I've asked uh, Scott to post the bill as passed the two chambers and the governor's veto message uh, to send it to us so we can print it out and look at it. Uh, but uh, I'd like to start uh, with uh, David, if I could, uh, to tell us what he understands from the veto message and from what passed to be the, um, the real, the issues as we can decipher from the veto message uh, that uh, we would need to change if to get the governor's approval and then we'll talk with Tate and he can probably shed even greater light on that. Is that okay with you folks or do you have suggestions for a different order? I'm not sure it matters. 
a lot, but I'd like to get grounded in the specifics of what we know so far. Um, and David, in your presentation, could you just go through, we don't have to deal with VHIP and the other things, but just to refresh our memory, what's in S79 and what, from your understanding, are the objectionable areas? Um, I know that there were several that we never intended to do anything other than what the governor was concerned about. So I think those are easily fixable. And then we can talk about the other areas where we did to intend to do different than what the governor wants. Clear as mud, right, David? <laughs> uh, yeah, good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, I, you know, honestly, I, uh, I, I would really uh, defer to the administration on its position with regard to its objections to the bill and um, the basis for the governor's veto. Uh, I, I hate to put words in their mouth. And honestly, I haven't read that letter in its entirety closely enough to, that I could, I could do that justice. So I, I'm glad that uh, uh, Mr. Brooks is here and he'll be able to do that. I can tell you um, sort of at a, at a higher level, uh, the, the, the thrust of the components of S79 and where I understand there to be some uh, discomfort with what the bill would have done had it not been um, vetoed. I mean, remember that, um, gosh, going back a couple of years now, um, you know, we discussed, I had prepared for you a, a rather lengthy compilation of, of the statutory and regulatory uh, provisions that currently govern rental housing health and safety. And there is a significant amount of overlap um, within the state and then, and then between the state and localities on what is supposed to happen, who has authority to do what with respect to rental housing. And right now, um, the Department of Health has uh, full regulatory authority over anything that might be considered a public health hazard or public health safety concern. And authority is vested in the Secretary of Health and the, in the Agency of Human Services in the State Department of Health um, at the state level to enforce those types of health and safety concerns. And under that authority, the Department of Health has adopted the Rental Housing Health Code, which addresses all kinds of issues from you know, building safety to infestations to adequate plumbing and heating and, and water supplies, et cetera. Um, that's all on the books, right? Um, and then the, sort of the other leg of the stool on the health side is that local governments, municipalities are also um, able to have local boards of health, local health officers, um, and enforce both the state components of that health code and also any local health regulations. Municipalities also have their own authority for building codes, they have building inspectors. So Lots of overlap between state and local health people. There is another component to the whole system, which is the division of fire safety within uh, the Department of Public Safety. And it has what is, I've always heard in testimony characterized as being about 60-ish percent of the same authority because it has fire safety and life safety, electrical plumbing authority over all what are called public buildings, which includes condos, it includes uh, state buildings, it includes commercial buildings, it includes um, a, not all living situations because it doesn't include single family homes, but it, it does include rental buildings. And so um, the thrust of S79 was to take a look at the situation we have on the ground, which is this State Department of Health has this authority, doesn't really exercise it. Local departments of health have the authority, don't really have the capacity. State Division of Fire Safety, Life Safety has 
the people and the know-how, but not enough capacity and not the complete authority to do everything that health otherwise should or would be doing. So S79 in a few places, in, in an attempt to just streamline the language into its existing authority, um, this bill would expand and give to Department of Public Safety the rest of what it doesn't already have provide personnel to do a, a, a complaint-based system as we have now, and to basically round out the rest of the inspection and enforcement that they don't already do under the auspices of fire and life safety. Um, there are ways, and I don't wanna to get too deep into drafting here, but there are lots of ways to crack this nut, right? We could have started from scratch and come up with a whole new chapter and title and law, chapter and subchapter in law and said, from the beginning, uh, public safety, fire safety, here's the parameters of your authority on health and safety for rental housing. Here's how you're gonna do your inspections. Here's how you're gonna do your enforcement. Here's what the penalties and fines are gonna be. Here are the remedies, et cetera. That could have been created from whole cloth. That was one way to do it. A second way to do it would be to take the language verbatim from what's already over on the health side and graft it into the public safety side and say, uh, Department of Public Safety, here's the exact same language that Department of Health has, you're gonna have it now. And we want you to do the same thing they're doing with the new people we're giving you. And then the final way, uh, third possibility would have been uh, to do it the way the S79 does it, which is to say, within the structure you've already got, uh, which is frankly a little bit unwieldy because it's been changed a lot over the years to not just be fire, but to be other things and say, we're going to try to just insert into your existing authority, whatever words we might need to be clear that you can do rental housing, health and safety. And so S79 does that, I'd say in a minimalist way, it also has an implementation provision at the end, which sort of parses out who's supposed to do what. And um, so having taken that path, I think there uh, are concerns, whether it's from landlords, the administration or whomever, uh, uh, about the way the words actually read because they, uh, you know, they're the existing law and, and that there may be a disconnect between what the law says and what actually happens, for instance. Um, this concept of a complaint driven system. Um, fire safety right now uses a complaint driven system. That is not the limit of their statutory authority. Technically tomorrow, fire safety could go out and have a system that's not just driven by complaints. And you know, it does that for new buildings. It has to go out and issue uh, permits and certificates of occupancy and stuff like that. But um, you know, large for, by and large, fire safety only has the people and the time and the capacity to do complaint driven inspections. And that was always, uh, at least from the testimony that I've heard, that was always their intent and always the uh, legislature's intent that that's the kind of system that would be continued into the future. Um, again, the statutory language is not specific on that point. It doesn't say when conducting inspection of rental housing, you shall only use an, an, a complaint driven system. And so I think there was definitely discomfort in some of the committees and some uh, of the communities about the absence of such language. So that's one possible disconnect. Um, another one is, is in sort of the enforcement side, the fines, the penalties. You know, there was some heartburn uh, within certain committees from certain members about you know, the breadth of the enforcement language that currently exists in law, where it says, you know, you could have criminal penalties or fines up to $5,000. And there was no, there was no attempt in S79 to uh, draw a tighter line around, for instance, um, you know, the penalty or the punishment fitting the crime. I, 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 that's a little, Again, that's a disconnect between what the statute says and what practices I and mean, in reality of any given enforcement scheme in all of state government, there is the way that the language usually constructed. It says a penalty or a fine shall be not more than or up to 5,000 per occurrence, not more than two years imprisonment, et cetera. I mean, the, the reality underlying 
every single one of those statutes, of course, is that there is always uh, some give and take, there's some push and pull between statutory uh, authority versus prosecutorial discretion. Um, you know, what will an agency or a attorney general pursue versus what they have the authority to impose. So I think a disconnect between what, how broad the language is in statute on enforcement versus I think a lot of people that were concerned about it would have liked to have seen some more tailoring um, on what the penalties should be for particular violations, et cetera. Um, you know, there's there's authority underlying in, in the statute about municipal enforcement, state enforcement, condemnation of buildings, the, these types of uh, broad provisions that are on the books that would have been carried over into rental housing that, that you know, could also be more tailored. But again, I think in this, you know, I don't want to speak for the division, but it was their preference at the time that this bill was being crafted that they uh, be able to avail themselves of the language that they already know and the format that they already have and the system that they already use. So they, rather than coming up with something new or, you know, borrowing from health, they felt more comfortable with the scheme that they already have. Um, that, again, that's that's been testimony over a few years. I, I'm not purporting to attribute any position to fire safety at this point. I have no idea what their position on the bill is, but as the bill was coming along um, and the options were being considered, that was testimony that I heard. Um, you know, the new pieces in this bill uh, are this the, the mandate for registering certain housing and uh, for providing data to the state. Um, you know, the legislature started down this path a few years ago by requiring the Department of Taxes to collate the data that it has through the landlord certificate and make that information available to the public. This would have gone, obviously, a couple of steps further. It would have been housed in DHCD. It would have added person power and funding to creation and maintaining of a, of a registry and a database. Um, there were guardrails in the legislation about who could access it and what for what purpose, but it, it definitely is another step um, beyond what is currently in Title 32 that the Department of Taxes is uh, charged with doing. Of course, there are exceptions um, to the registration requirements that are pretty technical. I don't think we need to get into those, but um, there's a lot of nuance in there about who is or isn't required to register. Um, you know, this, this bill would have created more positions. It would have created the registration fee that would fund those positions and that work on a go forward basis, um, up to five more positions at DPS, a couple of more at DHCD or one and a half plus the database management. Um, but otherwise, um, besides the VHIP and the revolving loan fund, that's, that's really the, the scheme. Um, and, you know, again, I guess I'll just finish by saying that uh, this disconnect between language and intent seems to be a pretty big divide. And, uh, and there's also some policy differences just on, you know, whether we should even have a registry or a database and, and who should administer that and whether there should be a fee, et cetera. So um, I'll leave it at that and see if you have any questions. David, that was great. Um, I want to ask the committee. I was going to, I'm going to honor David's uh, request, though. I think in some ways he violated his own request by go, going into unwittingly what the administration's objections were on several fronts. But uh, I was going to say we can turn that over to Tate to, to better do that. But I was wondering if the committee would like David to walk through the bill, um, at least up to the VHIP and other things, very cursory review, but to 
so you can see it again if you need your mind refreshed on the specifics of the bill i would ask him to take 10 minutes to just do that and then we would take a break um do you do you feel a need to see the bill i know senator clarkson doesn't but <laughs> but other people might benefit from just going through it again um uh, you know I, I always i generally like to do that because i don't want to assume that people have memories of the detail i mean i i i've live with this, I've met with Tate on this, and you know, uh, so I'm very familiar with all the sections, but it, it couldn't hurt to take 10 minutes to just see the bill again. I, I think also, Michael, it would be helpful for um, the people watching on YouTube. I, I think th those of us who've been intimately involved, you know, not everybody has been. So it, it, I think that as we launch into this work, it would be helpful for uh, the broader audience. Okay. Uh, David, could you take, could you with a 10 minute time frame, could you just walk us through S79, pull it up on the screen maybe? And sure. Um, I, I would turn to Scott and see if I am a co host at this point and able to sh share. It looks like I'm not, so I'd have to have that opportunity. David, I just made you a co host. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. The best way for me to do this is probably just going to be to pull it up here. Tate, are you okay with coming back at 10 after 11? Mr. Chairman, I'm okay with that. Yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, is everybody seeing S79 on the screen? Yep. Great. So, um, 37 pages, but uh, a, a lot of fill. So I will be quick. I will stick to the 10 minute timeline and take you through this briefly. Um, you know, as I alluded to at the beginning, we're talking specifically about the existing statute that governs the Department of Public Safety's Division of Fire Safety. Um, you'll see in this very beginning here, uh, chapter 173 is right now called Prevention Invest and Investigation of Fires. But again, um, over the years, those things have, th this, this, this authority has been expanded a little bit and in different areas, you'll see the reference to energy standards. I mean, that's just because of uh, some energy work you guys did. It's, it's, it's a little narrow, but what I'm trying to do here with expanding the title of the of the chapter and the subchapter is to reflect the fact that this isn't just fire anymore. That's not everything that they do. So for instance, I mean, in 27, 29, we're talking about not only the general provisions, we're talking about fire safety, we're talking about carbon monoxide, um, et cetera. So again, as I said, you know, the scope of their authority applies to what we call a public building, and you don't have the whole definition here, but it's expansive, and it does include, as you'll see already in D, a building in which people rent accommodations, whether overnight for a longer term. So, I mean, right now, fire safety has that authority over rental housing, over um, condos, over hotels, over Airbnbs, I mean, if it's rented to the public, then they have that 60% authority to come and do inspections and enforcement. This adds specifically rental housing as you are defining it in subsection F, and that is specifically to include long-term rental housing that's you know subject to chapter one, 9 BSA 137, that's a landlord tenant law, and then also short-term rentals as we define them in the health title in 18 BSA 4301. So both long-term and short-term rental housing, we just wanna make sure those are specifically included here. I mean, the, the crux of this whole thing is this line in 2731. It is adding um, you know, the authority to adopt rules governing the construction, health, safety, sanitation, and fitness for habitation of buildings maintenance and operation of premises, preventions of fires and removal of hazards, prescribed standards necessary to protect the public. And that is, that's a freestanding statutory authority. It's also the specific uh, authority to adopt rules to govern these issues. And that in could include, you know, having a very specific framework about how they do their work, what the standards are, et cetera. 
you'll see later on in, in the implementation section, the idea is that fire safety would adopt and whole cloth the current health code. David, I have one specific question on short-term sure. Sure. Short rentals. I know this committee and you worked on a short-term rental bill, maybe more than one. Yep. And I remember there having to be some notice to uh, people who are renting short-term rentals that if they had any complaint about it, they, they could call either the Department of Health or the Department of Fire Safety. Am I dreaming that up? No, you, that, that's, that's correct. The current law says that the, the proprietor of, of, of a short-term rental has to provide the contact information for both Department of Health and the Division of Fire Safety. So the implication, I guess, of that would be that at least the legislature intended that the Department of Fire Safety could do something with that complaint or the Department of Health could do something with that complaint. Correct? Yes, there's another provision in that uh, chapter that says that basically, you know, even though it's housed in Title 18 and it's under DOH, nothing in this is intended to, you know, limit the authority of the Division of Fire Safety. Okay, thank you. Yep. So 2731, I mean, again, as I said, uh, a lot of this is just the existing statute and authority. The new matter here in B3, this is an importation of the language from the current health code. A few years back, you guys added uh, to the local health officer section of Title 18 what they had to do as far as the protocol for inspections, investigations, and issuing reports. So this is that language. It is taken from um, Title 18 local health officials. It is put here so that when DFS would conduct these inspections and investigations, they'd have to follow the same protocol as far as issuing reports, what the violations are, how to correct them, et cetera. Um, you know, 2733 here, these orders to re repair, rehabilitate, remove a structure, all existing law, all existing authority, um, the one addition is that you have to provide notice to people who would be displaced by one of these uh, orders. The penalty provision, same. Uh, you know, this is this is existing law, and I think maybe this is a place where there's concern, where there's this opportunity to be fined not more than ten thousand dollars. Obviously, a significant amount of money, um, twenty for a subsequent violation, etc. Um, administration, administrative penalties of a thousand per violation. Again, these are all uh, part of the existing statutory authority for DFS. Um, same with 2736. The intent here is that a municipality that has its own program can continue to operate that side by side with the state. Um, you know, so this is this is a lot of language, but you'll see this is mostly just sort of. Uh, statutory cleanup. There's a lot of capitalization. Just one quick that. question on, on that. Yep. Uh, I, I was unclear whether uh, uh, the seven places that have their own program, do they preempt this or they're concurrent with this? They're concurrent. Okay. Yep. Um, they're concurrent now and, and the authority is concurrent. Whether you even have your own you know, a uh, detailed program established the way that Burlington does or your any given municipality. There is concurrent authority right now between the State Department of Health, the local board of health, local health officials, and then to the extent they apply DFS as well. Okay. All right. So, you know, uh, again, the, the housing registry is here. This would be added to DHCD. And you've got all this information that they're supposed to collect. Um, there is, there's some provisions here that deal with the interplay between a city that already has its own system, has to provide the information to the state. If you pay to register with a city, you do not also have to pay the state. Um, this is the registration requirement. It's housing and short-term housing. It's $35 fee per unit. Um, same deal about, oh, I already mentioned the fee piece. And then we have exceptions. If you're already registered with the mobile home parks uh, division, 
There's some nuance there. If it's not offered to the general public, you don't have to register it. If it's housing as a benefit of farm employment, you don't have to register that for a time. And there's the fund created to manage the fee revenue that's generated. Um, there is a penalty for failure, but that doesn't come online until a couple of years down the road. You guys set that up in a staggered approach. So the, the requirement comes online. The penalty for not registering is going to wait. Um, as I said, there were DPS positions authorized and DHCV positions, five and one and a half, respectively. Um, this is the local health pieces. This is just housekeeping. Um, no substantive change there, except for this inspection report language, as I said, is, is moved over to Title 20 and then uh, the language above says if you're working with DFS or you're doing an inspection on your own, you have to follow the same protocols, issue the inspection report, et cetera. So the transition provisions, you know, we're, we're about a one minute here, and I think this is important. So I'll spend my last minute on this. Is as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is sort of the roadmap of how things are supposed to work. <clears throat> so you'll see in A, so until DPS adopts rules governing rental housing health and safety, DOH, local officials, and DPS would have this concurrent authority to enforce rental housing health code adopted by the Department of Health. Two says DPS can immediately adopt a rule incorporating that code without having to go through the Administrative Procedures Act. So if they don't change it, they can just adopt it without having to do the rulemaking process specifically. It just moves from one department to another. However, if they do make substantive changes to that code, then they do have to go through the rulemaking process in the Vermont APA. Um, once they do adopt rules governing housing, health, and safety. This is how it works. One, DPS is the state government entity with primary authority to enforce state laws governing rental house and safe, health and safety. Two, DPS and local officials have concurrent authority to enforce state and local laws governing rental housing, health, and safety under these applicable chapters. And then three, DOH, state board of health, local health have concurrent authority to enforce state and local laws governing public health hazards and public health risks as those are defined in Title 18. So that's sort of the division of labor anticipated going forward if this were to become law. And I think that's it. You did a great job. Yes. Uh, um, okay, so David, are you able to stay with us till noon? Uh, unfortunately, I have to go back to commerce and start talking about Vita. Okay. Ah. At, at, at what time? Now? now. <laughs> okay. Well, if you can come, if you can rejoin us, that would be great. Uh, we're going to yep. hear from eight. Uh, it's now 1102. Let's come back at 1115 and we'll continue our discussion on this. And, Anybody and, have any questions or comments? I just want to say, David, I think you did a, a fabulous job. That was great. Oh, thanks. I will come back as, as soon as and if I can. Okay. Great. Okay. Right. Give uh, commerce so, our best. Yes. Indeed. So, so, Scott, can you take us offline and we'll reconvene at 11?